the Palantiri, ancient relics of power that allowed their users to communicate with one another. Yet they had many other uses that depended on the power of their user. Hello friends, it's Skarl here, and in today's episode we'll be looking into the lore and history of the Palantiri. So the name Palantiri comes from Quenya, Palan meaning far and wide, and Tyr meaning to watch. They were created by the Noldor Elves in Valinor, and it's possible that Feanor was their sole creator. In the Silmarillion, we're told the following about Feanor, and other crystals he made also, wherein things far away could be seen, small but clear, as with the eyes of the eagles of Manwë. In the Index of the Unfinished Tales, we're told that Feanor was the maker of the Silmarils and of the Palantiri, and besides the entry for Palantiri, it said that they were made by Feanor in Amman. The last two pieces of evidence for Feanor being their creator are two quotes from Gandalf. In the first one, he states, The Palantiri came from beyond westernness, from Eldamar. The Noldor made them, Feanor himself maybe. And later on, he states that he wished to use the Palantir to perceive the unimaginable hand and mind of Feanor at work. Now, the total number of Palantiri that were created is uncertain, but we know of at least eight seven of them being present in Middle-earth, while the other was located on Tol Eresea, an island off the coast of Valinor. They appeared to be made of solid glass and deep black in color, and their shape was that of a perfect sphere, and we're told that their size varied. The smallest ones were around a foot in diameter, while the larger ones, such as the Palantiri of Osgiliat and Amon Sol, were so large that they couldn't be lifted by one man. Despite their fragile appearance, they were extremely resilient. In fact, we're told that they were indeed unbreakable by any violence then controlled by men, though some believed that great heat, such as that of Orodruin, might shatter them. So now I'm going to briefly discuss each individual palantir, its location and history, before we discuss their properties. So the first palantir that we're going to talk about is located on Tol Eresea, an island off the coast of Valinor. This palantir was said to be the master stone, and it was placed in the Tower of Avalone, most likely by the Noldor. We're told little about its history, though we know that it remained in its tower undisturbed. I believe that this palantir could be used to view the other palantiri in Middle-earth, but it seems that this connection was one way. As in the Unfinished Tales, we're told that Elendil would often use the Palantir of Amin Berad to gaze into the west, and that sometimes he would see the Tower of Avalone from afar. If the Palantir of Middle-earth were connected to it, it seems odd that he wouldn't simply look through it rather than gaze across the sea towards it. Now the other seven Palantir were all located in Middle-earth, and their histories overlap a bit. Therefore, I'll first discuss their common origin before going into their individual histories. So these Palantiri were gifts to the men of Numenor from the elves of Valinor. According to the Silmarillion, these stones were gifts of the Eldar to Amandil, father of Elendil, for the comfort of the faithful of Numenor in their dark days, when the elves might come no longer to that land under the shadow of Sauron. During King Garfarazon's rule, Sauron was captured and taken hostage back to Numenor, where he convinced the king to launch an attack on Valinor to claim immortality. This led to the fall of Numenor and the island sank beneath the waves. However, the faithful of Numenor were still loyal to the Valor, and they were now led by Amandil's son, Elendil. They prepared ships to leave Numenor before its fall and the seven Palantiri were split up between Elendil and his sons. He carried three of them on his ship, while his sons Isildur and Anarion carried two each. When they reached the shores of Middle-earth, they established the Northern Kingdom of Arnor and the Southern Kingdom of Gondor, and the Palantiri were dispersed throughout their lands. Elendil's first Palantir was placed in Amin Berad, also known as the Tower Hills. This area was located to the east of the Grey Havens, and there were three tall white towers there. The Palantir was placed in the tallest tower, and it seems that it was unique and unlike the other Palantiri, as it could not communicate with them. Instead, it was only used to look across the Western Sea. 
It is said that Elendil could at times see the island of Tol Eresea in the vanished west. After Sauron's defeat, this Palantir was taken and put aboard Elrond's ship when he sailed to the Undying Lands. Elendil's other Palantiri were placed in Ammon Sul, later known as Weathertop, and in the city of Anumnas, the capital of the northern realm of Arnor. The Palantir of Ammon Sul was said to be the largest and most powerful of the three Palantiri of the Northern Kingdom, and it was used to communicate with the Southern Kingdom of Gondor. When the Witch King attacked the realm of Arnor, he laid waste to Ammon Sul, though its Palantir was saved. In the year 1974 of the Third Age, the city of Fornost fell to the Witch King, and Arnor's king, King Arvedui, fled north, carrying heirlooms of the Northern Kingdom including the Palantiri of Ammon Sul and Anumnas. He reached the icy wasteland of Forokel, and a ship was sent to find him and pick him up. Though Arvedui was advised to delay his travels till summer, when the sea was safer, he chose to ignore this, and a great wind came from the north and broke his ship against the ice. This resulted in the death of King Arvedui, and the two Palantiri were lost in the dark icy waters of the Bay of Forokel. Now Isildur's two Palantiri were located at Minasset Hill and Osgiliath. The Osgiliath stone was said to be the chief and master Palantir, and it appears that it was the most powerful Palantir in Middle-earth. It was kept in the Dome of Stars, and it seems that it had the unique property to eavesdrop on conversations between the other Palantiri of Gondor, which is most likely why it was considered to be the master stone. This Palantir was lost during the Gondorian Civil War, also known as the Kinstrife, when Osgiliath was burned down in the year 1437 of the Third Age, and it's believed that this Palantir fell into the waters of the river Anduin. Now Isildur's other Palantir was located in Minas Ithil, and it remained there till the year 2002 of the Third Age, when the fortress of Minas Ithil fell to the Ringwraiths. This Palantir was found and given to Sauron, who then used it throughout the War of the Ring to communicate with Saruman and to break Denethor's spirit. Following the destruction of the Ring and the fall of Barad-dûr, it's believed that this Palantir was lost or possibly even destroyed with Mount Doom's eruption. The last two Palantiri were carried on an Aryan ship and they were placed in Minas Anor, later known as Minas Tirith and Ortank. So the Ortank Palantir was in a region that, with time, Gondor became less concerned with. Ortank had been deserted, and its keys were kept in Minas Tirith, until they were handed to Saruman the White to serve as its warden. It seems that Saruman knew about the Ortank Palantir, and it might have been one of the reasons why he wanted to live there, to exploit its power. We're told that around the year 2000, Saruman started to use the Palantir, and he eventually made contact with Sauron and became ensnared by him. Following Saruman's defeat, Grima Wormtongue threw this Palantir down from the top of Ortank, and it was later used by Pippin, who foresaw the Siege of Gondor. This would not be its last use in the War of the Ring, however, as after the Siege of Gondor was broken, Aragorn looks into the Palantir of Ortank to challenge Sauron and to make him believe that he has the One Ring. It is said that after Sauron's defeat, this Palantir was kept by the King of Gondor, who would use it to watch over his realm and his servants. It seems that this Palantir had become linked with Barad-dûr, or the Palantir located there, for Gandalf says that it was so bent towards Barad-dûr that if any save a will of adamant now looks into it, it will bear his mind and sight swiftly thither. The final Palantir was located in Minas Anor, later known as Minas Tirith. Following Gondor's decline, few knew about its existence, and the stewards of Gondor acted as its warden. When Denethor II, the 26th ruling steward of Gondor came to power, it is said that he turned to the Palantir at once and that it might have played a part in his premature aging. Tolkien says that Denethor didn't encounter Sauron when using the Palantir for many years, and that at first he used it to gain knowledge and information. However, he eventually was ensnared by him, and Sauron broke his spirit by making it seem that Gondor's defeat was inevitable, which led Denethor to fall in despair. When Denethor perished in the flames of the pyre he had set up, he held the Palantir upon his breast, 
and it is said that after the War of the Ring, if any but a person of strong will had to look into this palantir, all they would see would be two aged hands withering in flame. Now we know little about the Palantiri's fate during the Fourth Age of Middle-earth, if the lost Palantiri were ever recovered and distributed once again. However, in the Silmarillion we're told, but all those that were brought to Middle-earth long ago were lost, which seems to suggest that eventually all the Palantiri in Middle-earth were lost. Before I discuss their properties, I'd like to share a thought I had while researching this topic. We know of eight Palantiri in total, and they most likely were created by Feanor. Now Feanor had seven sons, and together they left Valinor to wage war on Morgoth in Middle-earth. Is it possible that Feanor and his sons each carried a Palantir to communicate with one another, and that following their deaths, these were once again brought to Valinor to be given later as a gift to the Numenorians? Once again, these are simply some interesting thoughts I had that I wanted to share with you, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this in the comments below. Anyway, the Palantiri were divided into minor stones and major stones. The minor stones were those of Ortank, Minas Ithil, Minas Anor, and probably that of Anumnas, while those of Osgiliath, Amon Sol, and Amin Berad were major stones. It seems that the minor stones could only view one direction and had a fixed orientation, while the major stones could be used to view any direction. When using the Palantiri, if one wanted to look towards the east, they would have to stand to the west of the Palantir, or for example standing to the south to look towards the north. If one tried to use the minor stones to look in a direction other than their fixed orientation, all they would see is darkness. Each Palantir also had two permanent poles, an upper and a lower one, though there were no external markings to represent this. These poles would have to be set up correctly so that their sides stood upright, otherwise the Palantir would not function. It's interesting to note that when Pippin used the Ortank Palantir, he happened to set it up perfectly with its poles correctly aligned and viewed in its proper direction, considering it was a minor Palantir. During the peak of Gondor's power, each Palantir had a warden who had three duties. Firstly, to look through the Palantir at regular intervals. Secondly, to use the Palantir when commanded, and finally to use the Palantir during times of need. It seems that the Palantiri responded better to those with the authority to use them, such as the kings of Gondor or any wardens they appointed. It is said that the Palantir were far more amenable to legitimate users, which helped strengthen Denethor against Sauron's influence. Now the Palantiri did not transmit sound. However, transference of thoughts would be received as speech. Despite this thought connection, it was not possible to read the other user's mind. When using the Palantiri for vision, there were several things that one had to keep in mind. Firstly, if one wanted to see an enlarged vision, he should place himself around 3 feet away from the Palantir's surface. One must also focus and direct their mind, otherwise the visions would be haphazard, blurred and distorted. It was also possible for one to train himself to focus and enlarge part of the vision, though this typically would result in a decrease of detail and it was extremely tiring. The thing I find most fascinating when it comes to the Palantiri is that it was possible to see visions and scenes from the past. Gandalf mentions how he wished to look into the Palantir to see Feanor at work, and it makes me wonder whether these memories were stored into the Palantiri or if they could view anything in the past if one had the resolve and knowledge to search for it. When the Palantiri were used to peer into the distance, their sight could look past physical barriers. For example, if one wanted to look at something behind a mountain, it was possible to do so. However, they could only view things onto which some light fell upon, and so they couldn't be used to look at dark areas. Apart from darkness, there was another process called shrouding that could be used to guard against the Palantir's sight. This would cause the viewer to only see shadows or a deep mist, though the knowledge behind this process was forgotten and it became one of the lost mysteries of the Palantiri. Anyway friends, this wraps up the video and I hope you enjoyed it. If you can, leave a like cause it helps this channel immensely and subscribe to join our fellowship today. I hope to see you all in my next video where together we'll once again explore the magical world and lore of Middle-earth.